Good morning and welcome. My name is Heidi Roth. I'm a registered dietitian as well as holistic health coach. And I'm glad you could join me today for our presentation on fighting inflammation. So let's get started. Today we're gonna to be talking about what inflammation is. Why should we care about inflammation? We'll talk about some of the causes of inflammation and then steps to fighting inflammation. So to begin with, what is inflammation? You've probably heard a lot about it in the news, maybe written, uh, read some articles that have been written on it. But basically inflammation, when we talk about that, is the body's attempt at self-protection to remove harmful stimuli. So something that our body doesn't like, isn't making our body happy, right? Whether it's damaged cells, um, pathogens like viruses and bacteria can cause inflammation, irritants. It's part of the healing process and it's part of the immune response as well. So let's say you get a little cut on your finger. You might get, might get a little red, maybe it feels warm to the touch. You might get some swelling and pain. And this is your body's attempt to heal that cut. And it's in, in that case, inflammation is a good thing, right? When we talk about inflammation, basically anything that ends in itis indicates some sort of inflammation, whether it's bronchitis or pancreatitis, um, you know, so on and so forth. It, it, that cellulitis, it, it just really indicates that there's some inflammation going on and the body is attempting to heal itself which is a good thing. However, sometimes it can be not so good. When that inflammation turns into chronic or systemic inflammation that persists and the body always acts as if it's under, attacked, under attack and tries to protect itself. And I just saw a quote the other day that three out of five people worldwide die of some sort of inflammation. And you might be thinking, well, how could this possibly be? I've never really heard of this. And, you know, is inflammation a chronic disease? Well, inflammation can lead to many different types of chronic disease. That chronic inflammation has been associated with cancer, with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease. You know, with cardiovascular disease, I, I just heard an analogy the other day that we used to think of heart disease as clogged pipes, right? Your arteries got clogged with cholesterol and when they got completely blocked, that's when you had a heart attack. And now cardiovascular um doctors and cardiologists are really saying that, you know, maybe we need to think of this more as a pimple, right? Um, where there's a lot of pus and inflammation and um, that, that inflammatory re reaction going on and that it's not necessarily clogged pipes. You know, of course we think of chronic inflammation with arthritis and pancreatitis, but also autoimmune diseases. And many of these chronic diseases we can ask, well, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Do you get autoimmune disease first and then you get the chronic inflammation or that chronic inflammation contributes to the, to the autoimmune disease? And, and it, is, it, it is a little bit of the chicken and the egg because they both contribute to each other and it's this kind of vicious circle in a way. Um, you know, a couple years ago, Time Magazine had an article, The Secret Killer, and the, the surprising link between inflammation and all the different diseases. But many other diseases too that we don't necessarily think of right away with inflammation, things like osteoporosis, depression, anger disorders, Alzheimer's. Um, you know, it's been said that inflammation potentially is the root cause of most diseases. And we know for sure that inflammation can happen in the brain as well and leading to different types of, of brain disorders, whether it's obsessive compulsive disease or depression, as I had mentioned. So whatever we can do to stop inflammation and to manage it, we are going to be so much better off in so many areas. Um, it did kind of surprise me to see osteoporosis, right? I, 
out of all the things that you would associate with inflammation, I certainly wouldn't associate osteoporosis with it. But we, we need to remember that our bones are living organisms and they're not just kind of minerals put together that, that just kind of sit there. Our bones are constantly, you know, being remodeled and broken down and re being rebuilt. So what are some factors that increase inflammation? Well, we have environmental toxins, um, chronic stress, you know, that mind body connection is huge and chronic stuff, stress can definitely lead to a lot of different things. Um, you know, many times we think of chronic stress, especially with heart attacks, right? Or maybe with stomach issues like irritable bowel disease, but, but it can just impact a body in so many different ways. Um, lack of exercise, not moving at all, sitting all day. It actually takes very little exercise, even just 10 minutes a day is enough to help decrease the risk of inflammation. Uh, lack of sleep, whether it's inadequate sleep or poor quality sleep. And then probably the biggest one is abdominal obesity. And why is this? Well, when we think of fat, you know, maybe you think of the fat in your arms and legs and, you know, for the most part, it kind of just sits there and, and doesn't do too much. But the fat that we have around our abdomen, what we call visceral fat, that, that fat that's deep inside your abdominal cavity by your organs, this type of fat doesn't just sit there. It actually secretes inflammatory hormones. And we almost need to think of this type of fat as an endocrine um, disorder um, and an endocrine organ. Um, because it secretes so many inflammatory hormones driving up our levels of inflammation. So I would argue that maybe one of the best and cheapest things that you can do for your health is to buy yourself a measuring tape. Go to Amazon, they're $3. Um, and it can give you so much information about where you kind of stand health-wise. Ideally, men would aim for less than 37 inches and women would aim for less than 31 and a half inches. Um, the question is, you know, where, where should you measure? <laughs> um, you want about an inch above your belly button. You know, I know that there's some people that measure way down low behind kind of, you know, their quote unquote beer belly. And, you know, when, when you're measuring below that, you might get a number that you like. And if you're measuring really high up on your rib cage, right, behind, right underneath your bust, you might also get a number that you might like. Um, but no, the, the, measure, the measure that we're looking for is 31.5 inches, less than 31.5 for women. And, you know, different uh, people say different things. Um, the American Heart Association, I believe last I saw, they said less than 40 inches for men um, and less than 35 for women, but the American Cancer Association um, and a lot of cancer groups say less than 37, less than 31 for women. So just really quick, easy, cheap way to see where, where, where you stand. Some other causes of inflammation, of course, food sensitivities, allergies, that maybe that you don't, that, that are, you're not aware of. And by allergies, I really mean, you know, food allergies, um, dietary deficiencies. So getting inadequate vitamin C, getting not enough B vitamins, vitamin E, all of these things can contribute to inflammation, not enough antioxidants, and then eating pro-inflammatory foods. So what are some of the pro-inflammatory foods? Well, here we go. These are all the processed foods that are very typical of the American diet. And here you can see pro-inflammatory foods equals SAD. SAD is the standard American diet. That's the acronym. And it's a very good acronym um, because, you know, it's kind of sad that we're eating so much processed food. But when we talk about inflammation in the brain, um, and leading to depression and, you know, some, some mental disorders, you know, this diet contributes a lot to that. And we don't really think of maybe our brain health and our diet. So, you know, this type of diet is very hard sometimes not to eat, right? It's meant to be addictive. 
And whether it's high in sugar, high in fat, high in salt, high in refined carbohydrates, you know, high in those refined oils, all of these things can work together to make these type of foods really addictive. You know, as health professionals, we, we a lot of times learn new information and learn maybe the things that we said maybe were, you know, one thing kind of changed. And one of the things that I have kind of changed my mind on is how addictive sugar is in these types of foods. You know, when I used to hear that people would compare sugar to cocaine and say, oh, it's just as addictive as cocaine, I, you know, kind of rolled my eyes and said, yes, we know sugar is addictive, but really as addictive as, as cocaine, you know, that, that, that seems a little far-fetched. Show me, show me the studies. Well, actually we do have some studies to show now that sugar can be even more addictive than cocaine, um, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, and these are mouse studies and rodent studies. So yes, not humans, but um, just based on what we've seen, uh, it, it can be even more addictive. So we will talk about some ways to maybe cut down on sugar as well. All right, some other the, the pro-inflammatory foods, you know, as I had mentioned, the sugar, the carbohydrates, trans fats. Trans fats have been cut out a lot out of the American diet um, with some of the new uh, requirements and, and, and laws to get it out of our diet, which has been a good thing, but it's still in there in, in small amounts. Um, excessive alcohol, excessive omega-6 fatty acids, food additives, preservatives, um, potentially milk. And milk, you know, the, the studies vary, but many people do find that milk kind of ramps up inflammation. So really, if you're going to eat milk, the best ways to kind of enjoy dairy would be in some sort of fermented form, which changes some of the sugars that potentially can be inflammatory. So things like kefir or yogurt or cheese, all of those would be better ways to, to enjoy milk uh, if, you know, if you do find that it is some, somewhat pro-inflammatory. So what are the eight steps to fighting inflammation? So step number one would be to eat more cold water fish. I know probably not what you're expecting, right? <laughs> but when we talk about getting more omega-3 fatty acids, that has one of the biggest impacts on helping to decrease inflammation of how many pro-inflammatory fats we're eating versus um, fats that decrease inflammation. And we know omega-3 fatty acids decrease inflammation. So the more of these that we can get, the better off we're going to be. So we want to kind of look for the ones that contain the EPA and DHA. This is the form that our body uses, whether it's to make the membranes in our cells, you know, our brain, um, decrease inflammation, so many different things that, that our body uses these, these omega-3 fatty acids for. So how do we get some more? Well, things like herring, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, all of these type of fish are so high in omega-3 fatty acids and, and they're not likely to be contaminated. Some of the bigger fish like tuna, I know people ask me a lot about tuna and tuna is great, but it, it, it is more likely to be contaminated with things like mercury, which is not what we're looking for. So the smaller fish are better off. Now I see questions about what about, you know, farm salmon, is that okay? And to that I say, absolutely. You know, wild caught salmon is really going to be the best. You know, nobody is going to dispute that. But, you know, let's face it, the wild caught salmon can be very, very expensive sometimes. Um, I do tend to buy the wild caught from Costco. I buy it frozen um, and it tends to be probably the, the most economical way to enjoy it. But I'm a big fan of sardines. And I know if you, you know, kind of turn your nose up at sardines, I know a lot of people do, but I would suggest maybe go try a little can of smoked sardines, um, put some on some whole grain crackers. My routine is kind of as I'm making dinner, I pull out some sardines, I put a couple on a cracker and, um, and then, you know, I know that I have 
you know, no matter what we're having for dinner, I, I have my omega-3 fatty acids, some of the EPA and DHA every day. Uh, so I know a lot of people are saying, well, I hate fish. Can I take some fish oil supplements? And we will talk about that. Um, but, you know, what plant sources are there of alpha linolenic acid and the omega-3 fatty acids? You know, for those people that are 100% plant-based. So many forms of alpha linolenic acid of this omega-3s that, that we can eat. Keeping in mind that our body needs to convert these into the EPA and DHA. So some people are better converters than others. Um, but leafy greens, so many reasons to eat leafy greens, right? This is just one more reason to eat leafy greens. Can you buy yourself a big kind of clam box of organic spinach? I kind of just put that on my weekly shopping list and it's just something that's always on there. Use it in smoothies, um, saute, you know, a, a big bunch of them. That clam box will go very, very quickly when you saute it, you think, oh my gosh, it's so much. But if you throw it in a pan, a little bit of garlic and olive oil, and it, it kind of cooks down to almost nothing. Um, flax seeds, keeping in mind flax seeds need to be ground um, because if you eat them you know, in their regular form, they do tend to go pass through undigested. Chia seeds and hemp seeds don't need to be ground. Um, also amazing sources of omega-3 fatty acids. And then as far as nuts, what kind of nuts are the best? Walnuts. Walnuts have five times as many omega-3 fatty acids as other nuts. So um, what do walnuts look like? If you took a whole half of a walnut, what does it look like? I'm seeing, you know, people are saying it looks like a brain. Yes, absolutely. Walnuts look like our brain, right? The, the kind of ridges that we that we would see in our brain. And, and that's kind of, you know, nature's way of telling us eat some walnuts. It's really good for your brain because walnuts are high in omega-3s. Now, other nuts that we can enjoy too, Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts are incredibly high in a mineral called selenium. And selenium is a really, really strong antioxidant and, um, and can also help decrease inflammation. And some chestnuts are a decent source of omega-3s as well. The other nuts are all great sources of different types of beneficial fatty acids. But when we're looking for omega-3 fatty acids, really walnuts are, are going to be the best. So sprinkle some on your yogurt. Um, sometimes for a little afternoon snack, if I want to treat myself a little bit, I mix some walnuts, a couple raisins or goji berries, some dark chocolate, and I make myself a little snack mix. And um, that's kind of a, a nice, easy way to, to get some, some walnuts in. So step number three would be avoiding those pro-inflammatory fats. As we had talked about, omega-3 fatty acids decrease those inflammatory hormones in our body, those inflammatory chemicals. Omega-6 fatty acids increase it. So ex where do we find those omega-6 fatty acids? Well, really a lot of these refined kind of vegetable, refined vegetable oils, corn, safflower, sunbeans, sunflower, you know, they tend to be high in omega-6s. They oxidize easily, which means they go rancid easily. Um, so for these, we really kind of just want to be careful how much we're eating of these. It's always kind of best to enjoy these as seeds or in their natural form, not as oils. And Anytime you get any sort of packaged or processed food, salad dressings, go out to a restaurant and eat, they're using these kind of pro-inflammatory oils because they tend to be the cheaper oils. Fried foods, you know, anybody work in a restaurant? So I waitressed pretty much all through college. And, you know, you go back to where the cooks are in the kitchen and they have their fryer later. And at the beginning of the week, they put the, um, oil in the fryer later and it's nice pale golden yellow color and beautiful and then as the week goes on what happens that oil gets darker and darker and darker and at the end of the week or sometimes it's even two weeks um, it's almost this dark dark brown 
And that type of fat is dangerous because that oil, every time it's heated and reheated and heated over and over and over again, um, it kind of forms a lot of unstable molecules called free radicals, right? Oxidized fats. And these unstable molecules can, they like to steal electrons. So when we eat fried foods, it's not really just so much that we're worried about getting a lot of fat, right? Fat is really no longer, you know, the, the boogeyman that it used to be. And we've kind of taken away any restrictions on fat, but always the qualification is healthy fats. And unfortunately, fried foods tend to be a really unhealthy type of fat. Um, so, you know, if part of it is we are going to have more omega-6s than omega-3s, right? We're, anytime we eat, you know, nuts and seeds and oils, and we do get these omega-6s, but it's really more about the balance and the ratio. In an ideal world, we would have a four to one ratio of omega sixes to omega threes. And, you know, no one's going to calculate out how many they have per, every day. But the thought being, you know, are you at least getting some omega threes every day to add to contribute to that ratio? Because for many people, for the standard American diet, that ratio is 17 to one. And so what's happening now is we're eating so many more unhealthy fats than we are healthy fats. And that's a problem leading to a lot of the inflammation now that we're seeing in the American population. So step number five would be to add some more olive oil. You know, the diet that we're talking about now and all these things that I'm suggesting, these are all kind of components of the Mediterranean diet, right? Uh, healthy fats, avoiding lots of the unhealthy fats, avoiding processed food, right? Adding some more fish and leafy greens, walnuts, all part of the Mediterranean diet. But probably one of the things that we most think of when we think of the Mediterranean diet is olive oil. And why is that? Why is olive oil so, so healthy? Well, for several reasons. You know, it has what we call monounsaturated fatty acids, very healthy type of fatty acid, um, but really kind of one of the best things about olive oil is polyphenols. Polyphenols are plant chemicals that do many things for our body. They, one of the main things that they do is they act as antioxidants, right? And they also act to decrease inflammation. And there's one particular thing in olive oil called oleocanthal. And this is a polyphenol that you find in extra virgin olive oil, and it has some really unique benefits to it. It actually works like ibuprofen. There's, so there's kind of a fun story about this. Apparently, there was a researcher who was doing a lot of research on cold and flu medicines and, you know, drinkable medicines for, for flu and, you know, working a lot with ibuprofen. And he went to an olive oil tasting. He was on vacation, went to an olive oil tasting. And, and you know, as he was sipping the olive oil, he kind of felt this kind of stinging, maybe stinging is maybe too hard of a word, kind of a, a, a sensation at the back of the throat, his throat that made him kind of want to cough. Um, and, you know, kind of felt it at the back of his throat. And he said, oh my goodness, this is the same feeling that I feel when I, you know, if I were to crush up an ibuprofen and mix it with water and drink it. And that led him to change some of his research and he looked for what, was, what were the components in olive oil that did that. So, and that's oleocanthal and that's kind of one of the stories of how that was, was found. So when we're looking for a good quality extra virgin olive oil, we number one, we want the extra virgin. That's where we find all of these polyphenols and the oleocanthal and these anti-inflammatory benefits are most in the extra virgin. So keeping in mind, olives are stone fruits and the oil is very perishable. So try to look for a quantity that you'll use up quickly. When you, when you buy a bottle of olive oil, look that it's a dark colored bottle, right? Because if that oil is exposed to light, it's going to oxidize and it's going to, to turn rancid much more quickly. Um, 
you know, know the who, when, where of the oil. When was that, when were those olives harvested? Um, where did the oil come from? Right. Don't pay attention so much to color. Don't worry about the color. Depending on the variety of olives that were used, a good quality olive oil can be anywhere from green to a pear, pale straw yellow color. Um, so those are all, all okay as well. Uh, some olive oils that are excellent to very good. So this was the Consumer Reports 2012 extra um, virgin tests. I have to look and see if they've updated it in the meantime, but at the time, you know, Trader, Joy, Trader Joe's California Olive Estate is a very good olive oil. Um, this California Olive Ranch is a great brand as well. Um, and anytime you're buying or an organic olive oil, it's going to be a very good brand. And the reason I say this is that there is a fair amount of fraud in olive oil production. Um, olive oil is expensive to produce, right? To pr and so anytime that you're seeing an olive oil that seems like a too good to be true deal, it most likely is, you know, if you're, you know, a, a quart of olive oil for $5 of extra virgin olive oil, most likely probably either is not extra virgin or potentially has some other oils mixed in with it. So when you're buying from California, when you're buying organic, um, there's a lot less chance of, of fraud. Uh, so I know many times people say, you know, some of the questions, whoops, is, well, I don't like olive oil. You know, I don't like the taste of it. Are there any more neutral olive oils that would be okay? And yes, there are. Um, but, you know, you do want to make sure how was your oil produced? Many oils are highly, highly refined and use a lot of chemicals to extract them. Um, you know, if you kind of want to gross yourself out, you go to YouTube and watch a video on how canola oil is produced and all the different steps used to produce canola oil. So I like this company Spectrum um, and Spectrum is a company, they have organic oils and they also expel or press them, meaning they press the oil out. They don't use solvents to get the oil out, things like hexane and, you know, kind of gross, right? Um, so, and the spectrum is really nice too, because it also tells you right on the bottle that use this oil for high heat, use this for low heat cooking. So there's no guess on really what type of heat cooking that, that you need to, to, to use it. So step number six is to pack in the fruits and vegetables for many, many reasons. When you look at this picture here of all these gorgeous fruits and vegetables, what do you see? You see lots of colors. And those colors all indicate different plant phytochemicals. We typically think of, when we think about colors, we think of the beta carotene that you would find in oranges and carrots and um, squash. But what, how about that gorgeous red of the tomatoes? What antioxidant is that? That's lycopene. And the purple that you would get from the purple grapes or from eggplant or blueberries is something called anthocyanins. And so all of these antioxidants, they all work together to help our body you know, heal itself, to decrease inflammation, to prevent cancer, prevent heart disease. And the more of the rainbow that we can eat, the more of these different classes of antioxidants that we're going to get and you only find these in plant foods. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all of them have you know, different antioxidants, nuts and seeds. And what they also do is they provide fiber. The American diet, you know, when we looked at that sad diet and all those refined foods, guess what? That diet has barely any fiber in it. Ideally, we want about 35 grams of fiber per day is what we're shooting for and fruits and vegetables and plants provide wonderful sources of fiber for not only us, but also our gut microbiome, right? All the beneficial bacteria that we have in our gut, we want to feed them as well. And they take that fiber, those plant starches that we can't digest and they digest them. And when our gut microbiota digests all these plant fibers, they, they you know, they're healthy and happy, right? Because they got to be fed. 
Um, but they also do something else. They produce something called short chain fatty acids. And these are beneficial fatty acids that benefit us in many ways. And one of the main ways that they benefit us is um, that they help decrease inflammation, right? So when we talk about prebiotics, prebiotics is the fiber that we eat. Probiotics are any time that we eat something that containing live bacteria. So something like yogurt or kombucha or kimchi, that would be probiotics. Or maybe we take a probiotic supplement, right? With some lactobacillus. And now a new term is called postbiotics. And postbiotics refers to all the beneficial short chain fatty acids that our gut microbiota produce. And then lastly, a lot of these fruits and vegetables contain anti-inflammatory compounds. You know, we think of tart cherry juice is something especially that contains a lot of compounds that can directly impact inflammation. Now, some of the questions that I see then are to what about the nightshade vegetables? And nightshade vegetables are part of the, um, this family of vegetables that contain the alkaloid called solanine. And some, of, some people are sensitive to these vegetables, right? For, for most people, they, the research really shows that they don't cause a problem. Of course, some, some species of this plant family are toxic like the belladonna plant, but most of these vegetables, for most people, the research really supports that, um, that overall that these are still part of a healthy diet. Now there is some research to support that maybe solanine does have a direct effect on inflammation in susceptible individuals. So if you find that maybe you have arthritis and maybe you do find that when you eat eggplant and tomatoes and bell peppers that, that maybe you do find an increase in inflammation, um, then you know, then it would be best to avoid these. But, you know, these are such wonderful vegetables that contain such healthy, beneficial ingredients that it would be shame to just cut everything out, um, you know, with, with that concern that it might be a little bit pro-inflammatory for you. So uh, unless you know that it is pro-inflammatory for you, I, I eat all of these vegetables and I do enjoy them. Uh, there was a 2000 study, 10,000, uh, 2010 study that showed that purple potatoes, which is the same family as white potatoes, help to decrease inflammation. Um, so step number seven would be to spice up your life. There's so much research sh that shows that turmeric um, can decrease inflammation, as well as ginger, garlic, rosemary, chili peppers, oregano, uh, you know, name a spice. And there are, there's some studies showing that um, the correlation with decreased inflammation. I have a book on spices and, you know, whatever spice you go to, yep, can help decrease inflammation. But some are more well-known than others, especially turmeric. There are literally thousands of studies on, on turmeric and some of the, the health benefits. Ideally, turmeric is probably best eaten as part of foods. There's some question how much we really absorb when you're not getting it with food. Um, but really what, what helps turmeric absorption and utilization is mixing it with some fat and mixing it with some black pepper. I know many turmeric supplements contain black pepper, but if you are taking that supplement, don't take it on an empty stomach, you know, take it with a meal when you're going to have some fat and the absorption is going to be better. Um, ideally, when you're cooking with turmeric, you know, using some black pepper and, you know, maybe you're putting it in some potatoes, making sure that you're adding some olive oil to it and helping the absorption of the turmeric. I have been enjoying golden milk. So if you're not familiar with golden milk, golden milk is, you know, a plant-based milk. Sometimes I use soy milk, sometimes I use coconut milk, and I make myself a little golden uh, spice mix, which is a tiny bit of pepper, some turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, cardamom, and I mix that, you heat up the milk and then mix the spices in, and it's just such a lovely drink. Um, you know, before bedtime, um, or just any time that you're looking just to relax a little bit. It's, it's nice kind of afternoon drink as well that, that I've been enjoying. 
Um, so step number eight, add in some treats. You know, a lot of suggestions that dark chocolate and all the uh, flavanols in, in dark chocolate can be beneficial for decreasing inflammation. So, you know, the darker, the better. Uh, maybe perhaps a small amount of red wine. Um, don't start drinking, absolutely, because we, we you know, the, the studies are very, very clear that excessive amounts of alcohol um, definitely ramp up inflammation. Um, but red wine does have some benefits that for, with the resveratrol. So if you enjoy some red wine here and there, continue to enjoy it, but really being careful that it's, it's um, five ounces or less per day for women. And then, um, you know, less than two glasses per day, for, for two glasses or less per day for men. Uh, green tea uh, has a lot of beneficial compounds in it, yogurt, we had talked about all the probiotics. So all, those are all some things that I, that I enjoy. And then people always ask about supplements, of course, too, right? So vitamin D, high levels of vitamin D are, are correlated with lower C-reactive protein. So C-reactive protein, when you go, I see some questions on, you know, how do we know if we have inflammation? And one of the tests is the CRP test. So you can go and ask your doctor, hey, you know, I'm just curious, do I have any inflammation going on? Could you do a CRP test for me? And that kind of gives an overall view of, of the levels of inflammation. There are, you know, more detailed tests that they can do too, but this is kind of the most common one. Uh, so, um, but we know from studies that higher levels of D are correlated with less with a lower CRP. So we're all coming out of winter time. We live here in New England and uh, how we most likely are going to be a little bit low in vitamin D unless we're taking a supplement. So about 50% of the population, you know, from Boston and North really has a hard time getting enough vitamin D because of the cold weather. And, um, so because of that, I, you don't need to take a lot, a thousand IU per day, unless of course your doctor has done your vitamin D level and has told you, hey, listen, you're pretty low, you need to, to increase your level. Um, fish oil, so if you are going to take a fish oil supplement, making sure that you're taking a high quality one, um, you do want to, to throw it out past the expiration date. So with fish oil, it does go rancid. I keep mine um, in my refrigerator. So every once in a while, you know, if I feel like, oh gosh, I haven't had fish for a while, I haven't really, you know, what kind of omega threes have I had today? I, I do keep them in the refrigerator just to kind of as a backup. Um, but I like the Ultimate Omega, the Nordic Naturals. Those are both good brands. Um, but keeping in mind too that fish is always the best. It's always best to get it from food. And um, a lot of the studies done on fish oil supplements and heart disease have shown that the fish oil supplements just don't work as well as eating fish does. So fish would always be, be first. Uh, curcumin and turmeric. Curcumin is the active compound that you find in the spice turmeric. So that might be something to consider as well. Um, make sure that whatever brand that you're getting that it does contain a little bit of black pepper as well. So, um, questions, comments, um, thank you all so much for, for joining me here today. Um, I'm seeing one question on um, just, you know, postmenopausal women and waist circumference. And I know this is a tough one, right? It does, managing your weight does get much, much harder postmenopausal. And just naturally women tend to lose their hourglass figure, right? Post-menopause, we tend to kind of trend a little bit more towards that apple shape. Um, and it's something that, yes, we do have to kind of <laughs> fight against. Uh, some of the things that you can make sure that you're doing is just, you know, in addition to diet, in addition to all the things that we talked about is really just watching the four pillars of health and are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting quality sleep? Have you done everything that you can possibly do to make sure that you're getting quality sleep? Are you exercising? You know, and even if it's just a 10 minute walk three times a day, are you maintaining your muscle mass? 
this is a huge thing with postmenopausal women is that we do tend to lose a lot of muscle mass. And so how are you working to maintain your muscle mass? Are you doing some push-ups every day? Are you maybe some planks, um, you know, doing a, a muscle pump class? And then lastly, too, stress management is really a big one as well. So whatever you can do to manage stress is also going to help kind of prevent that apple shape a little bit and get, gaining weight around the, the waist. Anytime we're stressed, we do secrete more cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone that unfortunately deposits fat around our waist. So, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on and, and however you can take time for that self-care and stress management um, is, is a good thing. So, Thank you so much for joining me here today. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and um, stay healthy. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.